Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to Wake Up with Edie Darling. I'm your host and ambassador of peace, Edie Darling, and I truly count it a joy and a blessing to come before you each week speaking life into your life. For the first time listeners out there and for my valued and growing listening audience, I want to thank you for tuning in weekly. Now, before we go into today's inspiring episode, I would like to personally thank my husband, Chris Gway, for constantly encouraging me to walk out my God-given purpose. I would also like to thank the sponsors of this show, WUJM 99 Jams, The Berg, Groove Hub Nation, and Craig Daniels for their support. And to you, my listening audience, my desire is to awaken you to the awareness and knowledge that we are not alone. We are family. Regardless of our race, our ethnic background, our cultural differences, our religious beliefs, our political affiliations, our sexual orientations, whether we are rich or poor, we are one body. What happens to one impacts the lives of all. This show builds bridges of compassion for God's diverse people through faith, hope, and love. It encourages you on your journey to do more and be more in God. It will inspire you and motivate you to think outside of tradition and prepare you for your greatest potential on becoming a well-rounded individual in mind, body, and soul by focusing on the here and now, the new day that you have been blessed to see, but the time is now to awaken your dormant gifts. This show also actively seeks to bridge the gap between community and law enforcement relations. By bringing the community, leaders, citizens, and law enforcement together at a round table of peace to address any issue that negatively impacts our communities, impede the safety of all, inhibit investigation, hamper police relations, and tear at the very fiber of our human condition and jeopardizes humanity. On today's episode titled Iron Sharpen Leadership, I have the honor to have across from me U.S. Army retired Major General John Gronsky, a decorated combat veteran whose key assignments include Deputy Commanding General for National Guard at U.S. Army Europe 2016 to 2019, Commanding General of the 28th Infantry Division 2012 to 2016, and Brigade Commander in Ramadi, Iraq 2005 to 2006. General Gronsky is a graduate of numerous Armory schools, including the United States Army War College, the Infantry Office Advanced Course, Ranger School, and Airborne School. His awards include the Army Distinguished Service Medal with Oak Leaf Cluster, Legion of Merit with Oak Leaf Cluster, Bronze Star, and Iraq Campaign Medal. He has also received awards from the governments of Poland and Lithuania for his work with their armed forces. He is the founder and CEO of Leader Groove, no, Leader Grove LLC, a leadership consulting firm and the author of two books titled Iron Sharpen Leadership and The Ride of Our Lives. He is an international and Fortune 500 speaker, leader trainer, an executive coach and holds an MBA from Penn State and a Master's of Strategic Studies from the U.S. Army War College. You can learn more about um, John at johngronsky.com. Good morning, John. Thank you for coming on to Wake Up with Edie Darling to share leadership tips with our listening audience. Hey, Edie, it's great to be here. And thank you for this cup of coffee. It's delicious. (laughs) Well, you're more than welcome. Listen, I want to delve right in. I have personally read your book, Iron Sharpen Leadership, several times, and I can definitely appreciate your willingness to share what you have learned as a leader with upcoming leaders today. So let me ask you, let's start from the beginning. What inspired you to go into the military? You know, uh, something very simple. I just wanted to get out of my hometown. Yeah. You know, I, I just, you know, I grew up in a small town in northeastern Pennsylvania. And I just wanted to see the bigger world out there. But this is the thing. After I joined the army, and again, when I when I joined the military, little did I know I would spend over 40 years in the army. Wow. But the reason I spent that long is because I loved what I found. Mm-hmm. You know, the shared values, the camaraderie, the sense of service to our nation. All of those things are what kept me in the army, even though those things didn't necessarily bring me into the army. That is amazing. Okay, so as a leader and a man of faith, how did you balance and incorporate your beliefs in your military role? Because, you know, we think about the title of your book, Iron Sharpen Leadership. That, when I think of that, I think about the scripture that iron sharpen iron. So how did you do it? Yeah, uh, 
Well, you know, I'm, I'm a, I, I believe I'm a servant leader. Yes. I mean, if somebody asked me what my leadership philosophy is, I would say, it's, you know, it's character based and it's uh, based on being a servant leader, which means leading those we serve. And so I think that's very, very um, congruent with my faith as, as a Christian, because I mean, you could read the Bible and you know, people ask me when I, when I go on these uh, talks to uh, uh, talk about leadership or conduct leadership workshops, I always tell people, if you're, if you're planning on hearing something new about leadership, you're in the wrong place. Because right. <laughs> what has been written about leadership is written about 2,000 years ago. Right. And if you want to become a good leader, simply read the Bible. There are so many quotes in the Bible uh, that really um, orient toward servant leadership and serving others. And, you know, Jesus said, you know, the, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. I mean, yes. all of those things to me speak of servant leadership. And then you talk about the title of the book, Iron Sharpen Leadership. It is based on Proverbs 27, 17. Yes. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And, and I, you know, to me, what that speaks of, if, if you want me to expand yes, on that. Yes, please. Is, uh, but what it means to me is as leaders, we have to find people in our life who we could use as mentors and coaches. Some some folks who are more talented than we are, some folks who are a little bit stronger than we are, we have to reach our hand up to them and be humble enough yes. to let them know that, hey, we need some advice here, we need some coaching here, no matter how long we've been in the leadership uh, right. role. And then at the same time, we have to reach our other hand down and find others who, who need a hand. Right. And, and we have to look for uh, people that we could coach and people that we could mentor because I think one of the key roles of any leader is to develop future leaders. Absolutely. And so it goes both ways. And, and uh, so anyway, I think uh, my faith as a Christian is very, very aligned with my service in the military. That's amazing. As you've moved through the ranks as a leader, was there one specific incident, or can you talk about an incident that made you look at the type of leader that you were and how you could make improvements? You know, that's a, an interesting <laughs> question. And uh, yeah, you, you know, after I spent about 20 years in the army, I thought I knew everything. Right. You know, I had commanded a company, I commanded a battalion of over 850 soldiers. And then I get this assignment where I have to go to the country of Lithuania. And I'm going to be in charge of three other Americans, you know, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel from the Marines, a uh, major from the Army and an Air Force NCO. I thought, wow, I just led 850 soldiers and people tell me it was a successful command. This is going to be a piece of cake. Right. So I get over there thinking I knew everything about leadership. And after being there for several weeks, I just felt like, man, the team wasn't gelling with me. Something wasn't, yeah. wrong, wasn't right here. And then the, the major had enough personal courage to come into my office and ask if he could talk to me. And I, I said, yeah, sit down. I thought he wanted some sage advice for me. You know? <laughs> and, and uh, you know, he looks at me, he goes, sir, he goes, you're tearing this team apart. Mm. And man, my jaw dropped. I said, what do you mean? Like, tell me, tell me what you're talking about. He said, well, you know, you came in here, you know, we've been here for months already. You mm -hmm. just got here and you're starting to change things. And I made a lot of rookie mistakes. Right. I didn't ask them why they were doing certain tasks. I just told them to change the way they were doing things, which is really a big mistake. Right. I was telling them to do things without explaining the why behind it. You know, right. all of these things that I learned from this experience. And so, yeah, that was a time when I was kind of arrogant uh, and I thought I knew everything about leadership. And thank God this major who was about you know, two ranks uh, below me because I was a colonel at the time, had enough personal courage to come in and uh, help me see the light in terms of the leadership failings I was having. And, and you know, I believe in a growth mindset, mm -hmm. which means we always have to be open to learn. Yes. And thank God I had that growth mindset. I took what he said to heart and I called the team together the next day and I explained to them that it was brought to my attention that my behavior was dividing the team and I apologized for that. And I explained some of the actions I was going to take to re rekindle their trust mm -hmm. with me. And then, you know, it took, it took a few months because, you know, words are one thing, but they wanted to see my actions. actions. Yes. And so, uh, you know, I made sure that I demonstrated the actions I told them I was going to do by asking their opinion 
uh, by uh, getting their input into decisions and by rolling up my sleeves and sharing the load with them, you know, all of those things we could do to cultivate trust. And uh, so that was really an eye-opening experience to me. And I learned a lot. I'm very thankful for that. You know, when I hear this from you, John, I wish more leaders were in that mindset of we all have room to grow. Yeah. But it's taking the time out to hear what is being said, um, to seek understanding, and then also to make corrective action. So that's truly what I would say is a humbling experience for you that to be able to go through that because to have a subordinate come to you and say, you know, as you've mentioned, having the courage yeah. to be able to come to their commander yeah. and say, listen, can I share this with you? Yeah. And that you didn't take it offensively right you know because you could have just said get out of here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah what do you know you know i'm, I'm an expert You're right not. exactly yeah. but yeah. that shows to your character <laughs> so let's um move on for a moment because you just talk about cultivating trust why is that so important as well, a leader you know I, I don't think uh any organization a family yeah a company mm -hmm. a law enforcement unit a military unit could function properly and effectively and efficiently if you don't have trust. I, I look at trust really as the lifeblood flowing through the veins of an organization. That's why I think it's so important because this is the thing. If you're in an organization doing your job mm -hmm. and you don't trust the leader mm -hmm. and you don't trust the people around you, you're gonna be more focused on watching your back mm -hmm than be focused out trying to do the job that you're hired to do. Right. That's why it's so important because we don't we don't want an organization where everyone is focused on watching their back rather than oriented outside, focused on doing their job. And you know, it's interesting that you say, um, you know, watching your back because people have a tendency of believing that, okay, if I can't, if I don't know what my leader is thinking or if I can't trust my leader, then I have to always be on edge yeah. that I'm doing something wrong. And what's going to, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, prevent me from getting into trouble. So they're always thinking in a, I'm gonna get in trouble. Yeah. But in, in your book, you said that people, um, when rightly and fully trusted will return the trust. Yeah, yeah. It, and that was a, a quote by Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, yeah, a absolutely. And, and that's why, you know, I talk about best practices for cultivating trust in an organization. And the thing I talk about is a leader has to trust others first mm -hmm. before they're going to be trusted. Mm -hmm. and, and that means if you're a leader going into a new organization or a new team, you've never worked with these people before. I'm saying you've got to take the risk of trusting those people that you've never worked with before first. Mm -hmm. And some people dispute that. I, and, and this is the question I ask them. Have you ever worked for a boss who didn't trust you? Mm -hmm. And some people say, well, yeah, I, I, I had a boss like that who didn't trust me. I always say, well, were you able to trust that boss or were you able to trust that leader? And their answer is always no. Wow. So if you don't take the risk to trust others first until they show you that they can't be trusted and then obviously you have that candid conversation with them uh, you're, you're not going to be able to grow trust if you go in thinking well, i'm not going to trust anybody until they prove they can be trusted they will not trust you yeah. guaranteed one of the things that you um going back to when you had that conversation with the troops in mm -hmm. lithuania you said i told them i trusted them completely yes that's so powerful that here you are saying to them, you know your job. Yeah. And I trust you that you know your job. Yeah. Well, you know, think about it. Uh, you know, in law enforcement, in the military, the, the, the people that we lead have gone through training. Yeah. We know that. Mm -hmm. So they're certified to do their job. And even in business, you know, most people being brought into a company have gone through some type of training, hopefully. Right. Uh, so. I think we've got to trust that that training worked. Uh, I think in the hiring process, uh, hopefully we're looking for character-based people. Yes. So, you know, if, if we're if we're hiring people without regard to their character, I think we're making a mistake to begin with. So we've got to give them the benefit of the doubt that they know their job and that they they exemplify the same values that our organizational values are 
identified with. Yes. You know, um, there was one thing in your book, it talks about radar, right? Yeah, yeah. And that is recognizing the knowledge that a violation has occurred quickly, mm-hmm. right? Apologize, say you are sorry, don't make an excuse. That is one of the hardest things I think for some leaders to do is just say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, I'm sorry. And then you, um, um, the D is determine what caused the violation and admit it. And then you say, admit the action was destructive and then take a responsibility, take responsibility for the act and change past practices that broke that trust. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, Edie, since I wrote that in the book, I've, I've actually simplified that. Yeah. Uh, I say, you know, if you make a mistake, leaders have to acknowledge they make it. They made the mistake. Yeah. They have to apologize if they made that mistake. And then they have to correct wrongs. Yeah. And, and, and this is the thing. You have to acknowledge and apologize very, very quickly if you hope to rebuild that trust again. For example, if you break trust with somebody and you wait for three weeks before <laughs> you bring that person in and acknowledge that you broke their trust and apologize, you're probably never going to be able to repair that trust. Wow. You've got to do it very, very quickly. And then when I say you've got to correct wrongs, that means you've got to explain to the people what you're going to do differently so this doesn't happen again. And if you t- could do those three things, I think you uh, have a, a great uh, opportunity to rebuild that trust with people. So let's continue for a moment. So in chapter six of your book, um, you talk about what leadership is all about, but you begin with this quote from the Infantry Journal of 1948, which says, no man is a leader until his appointment is ratified in the minds and hearts of men. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah. Um, You know, you could be put into a formal leadership position, Mm -hmm. but uh, the people you lead are not going to accept you as the leader until they see that you truly care about them. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's a, a, a saying, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. And I truly believe in that. And that and that's, to me, that that's what that quote is all about. Right. Uh, you've got to show the people you lead that, that you care about them. And, and hey, there's different ways to show you care about them. First of all, yeah, get to know the people. Uh, get to know, you know, what's going on in their family life and all that. That's great. But the other way you can show people you leave that you care about them is really finding out, hey, what obstacles are in the way of them doing their job? Mm -hmm. And then your authority as the leader, you seek to remove those obstacles. Or if you have to go to your boss to get those obstacles removed, you do that. If, If people see that you're willing to remove obstacles from their path so they can do their job more effectively, that's a great thing. And then the other thing is provide resources. Right. You know, they may need some resources to do their job better. They may not have the authority to get those resources, but you and your leadership position do, or your boss may have that authority. So fight for the resources your people need. And I think if you could do those things, you're going to show people that you actually care about them. You know, one of the things that you said earlier is um, when you were in Lithuania and um, you were willing to pull up your sleeves and take on some of the load. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of times individuals who follow leaders want to know that that leader is not just going to be somebody who's going to push you out front, <laughs> you know, yeah. but that you're going to stand with them and go the full course with them and pull back the sleeves and um, work alongside them. Yeah. It's not just telling me what to do. Yeah. Are you willing to work with me to accomplish the goals that you want to accomplish Yeah. or yeah. that you see for the vision? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, again, another saying, bosses say go, leaders say let's go. Yes. So leaders are right along with their people uh, being there, again, as you said, to roll up the sleeves and, and share the load and, and help them right along the way rather than standing back and letting them do all the work. Right. And another powerful thing that I take away from this is that, you know, here you have been in the military for over 20 years, right? And like you said, you thought you knew everything. But yet there was something still that you had something to learn, you know, that you still had a willingness to learn. Because a lot of times you could be in a role for so many years and have a closed mindedness, but you are you are an outside of the box thinker, you know, to be able to say, okay, there's still growth. Yeah. And I think this is a good lesson for leaders. You, you know, a lot of times we reach a certain plateau Mm -hmm. and we, we think, okay, we don't have anything else to learn, but this is the way to look at it. You've mastered 
what you've learned, yeah. but there's more to learn. So you've got to put yourself into an apprentice role. Absolutely. Knowing that you could still learn more. Absolutely. I want to get this other things in, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, love language of leadership. <laughs> I don't think too many people will talk about that. So expound on that for a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you have to let the people you lead know how you feel about them. Yeah. You know, I, I like to say one of the best things you could, you could tell someone that you're leading when they do something right is, is let them know how proud you are of them. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if leaders tell people that they lead uh, how proud they are of certain individuals when they do something right. And that's the other thing. You've got to recognize when people do something right. You've got to celebrate the behavior you're looking for. Absolutely. You know, and, and you know, there's some leaders I've talked to at, at various workshops I, I've done who, who said, well, you know, they get paid to do that. Why should I compliment them? It's kind of like the reason you need yeah, to compliment Yeah, money's them. not everything. Yeah, you know. We it, need accolades <laughs> of verbs because just like there's a love language in, um, you know, leadership, yeah. there's love language in relationships and everybody's love language is not the same. It, and and see, that's really getting to know what, what makes your people tick. You know, some people appreciate a pat on the back. Yeah. Some people like some type of monetary reward if possible. Some people like to be recognized in front of others. Other people really don't like to be recognized in front of others. Right. Some people like it when the boss spends time talking to them. Absolutely. You know, so different love languages, like you mentioned. Yeah. Um, remaining calm during the storm. You know, when I think about this, I immediately, I think about Jesus and the disciples on the boat and yeah. the storm is raging and the disciples go to Jesus and say, do you not care that we <laughs> perish? And here's Jesus who gets up and say, oh, ye a little faith and speaks to the storm and say, peace be still. Yeah. Talk about that for a moment. Yeah. You know, I really learned this over in Ramadi, Iraq, because it was very violent, very dangerous. Uh, you know, we, we, we lost many of our soldiers, Marines and sailors uh, over there, uh, both killed in action and, and wounded in action. And uh, I realized that, you know, the soldiers, Marines, they want a leader who's going to be a rock. Yeah. They don't want a leader who's going to crumble. And I think everybody is looking for a leader like that. And I like to say leaders don't need to be great all the time, but they need to be great when it matters. Yes. There's certain crisis, crisis situations that occur in any organization. And that's when the leader really needs to stand up and lead and go forward where the action is and be present and, and let people know that, hey, you could count on me. I'm here with you. Let's get through this together. And um, before we close out, I want you to talk about preparing to learn lessons yeah uh you know i think you again i mentioned growth mindset a number of times here already i think that's important you have to be uh humble enough to realize that you don't know everything mm -hmm. so you've got to prepare to learn and you know you've got to ask people hey what could i do better uh i spoke at a church group mm -hmm. a few weeks ago and a friend invited me in to speak and uh the next day i gave him a call on the phone I said, hey, Eric, I said, could you tell me, you know, where I could improve in the talk that I gave? Yes. He goes, wow. He goes, I don't believe you're asking that. He goes, I need to ask that more often myself. Yeah. So you've got to be willing to reach out to people and ask people, hey, how could I improve in what I just did? Or what did I do well that you think I should sustain? Yes. Uh, so that, that's the best way you could be prepared to learn. Well, I hope you were encouraged by this message of faith, hope, and love. And I want to personally thank you for tuning in to Wake Up With Edie Darling, titled Iron Sharpened Iron, or Iron Sharpened Leadership. If you have a unique story of how you or your community have turned a negative situation around through faith, hope, and love, I would like to hear from you. Email me at awakenyourdormantgifts at gmail.com. Also, if you feel your community, business, organization, or government entity are stuck and can't seem to move forward, for the sake of all, and you desire a peaceful resolution, I am here for you. Before we end this episode, I would like to leave you with this parting prayer from General John Gronsky. Yeah, Edie, thank you. And, you know, I'll, I'll ask God, I'll ask Jesus to guide me in the words I'm going to say to pray for our military personnel who are all, all around the world doing very hard work for our country and for our law enforcement officers who are in this country protecting our communities. So I would just say that, um, you know, Jesus, please keep 
um, please display and provide the mercy uh, to our military personnel who are guarding our way of life throughout the globe. And also, uh, place your shield of mercy uh, and wrap that cloak of mercy around our law enforcement personnel who are doing their best to protect our communities. And Lord, please keep our military and our law enforcement officers in, in your heart and, and in your prayer. And may you guide them. Amen. Amen.